Um, thank you too for inviting me. This is and and uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, reach out and meet folks different parts of the world and learn from each other. And I hope you'll enjoy this talk. It's different. Um, I would say the complete bee honeybee person uh, is is a bee is a beekeeper, of course, um, and also a uh, bee trapper by putting up bait hives and getting wild colonies, getting swarms that way. And then thirdly is a bee hunter. And bee hunting is a is the craft of going out and lining your way back to colonies you didn't know about. They might be colonies that are in somebody's apiary, <laughs> or they could be colony a colony living out in the woods. Um, so that's what we're going to be looking at today. And we're going to it's both a craft and a science. So I'm going to tell you the craft is how you do it. The science is why the why these methods work. So that's what we're going to look at. Okay, what is bee hunting? It is hunting for a wild colony of honeybees. And it's a very ancient craft, for sure. Uh, there's, there's a European tradition of doing this. Um, and here's an old photo of a Hungarian bee hunter. And his, they had some, the early um, traps or devices for doing the bee hunting um, uh, were made out of horns, as you can see, or, or other, other objects. Uh, and uh, basically what they, all of these things do, uh, these bee traps are ways to capture or trap bees foraging on flowers get them in a confined space, introduce them to a piece of comb filled with honey, and then um, to allow them to discover that super duper food source, then you let them out and then you can follow them or line your way back home to their nest. And that was good before people had beehives and it's a bit, there was a big tradition for centuries in Europe where the Apis mellifera was native. And there's a, as you can see, a curiously rich literature on bee hunting using a bee trap. I, I will call it a bee box, but often they're called bee traps. There's a book back in, written in 1591 uh, about beekeeping, and uh, it included uh, material on bee hunting. And here's an, the name of an author, an American author that might be familiar to you, John Burroughs. He wrote, um, he, he was a naturalist, wrote in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and in one of his books, Birds and Bees, Sharp Eyes, and other papers, uh, he wrote um, a very good account of bee hunting that he did in the Catskill Mountains of New York State. Um, probably the most famous former bee hunter was Henry David Thoreau. And uh, here's a journal entry that he made, one of his accounts of bee hunting from back in 1852. 10 a.m. to Fairhaven Pond, bee hunting. Pratt, Rice, Hastings, and myself in a wagon. A fine clear day after the coolest night and severest frost we have had. The apparatus was a simple round box, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I was able, I was able to um, track down his, the originals of his, of his journals. They were, they were held in a library in New York City, and I got a photo of them. This black, <laughs> this blue line goes through there because once upon a time there was an editor that was trying to figure out well what part of his journals do are are useful or good and the ones that he didn't think were good he drew a blue line blue line through them well i would have to tell him this is a very good part of his journal <laughs> i think you both you'll agree and as i mentioned in the past most bee hunters were out to get honey and here's and this is a good this is a great um drawing of this process from Harper's Weekly back in 1883. You can see there's a gentleman up here. He's got an ax. He's chopped open this tree. He looks like he's a very risky situation. Two hands on the ax and no hands on a tree limb. That looks dangerous. And his partner's coming up with a bucket. And um, he's chopping open the tree to reach in and get the honeycombs. And where I grew up, there was an old lady and she didn't have much money. She lived down the road a ways. And um, she told me that when she wanted to, to have a, to get a sweet sweetener, um, she had found some beehives, bee trees, I should say, and uh, took an ax, chopped open a part of the 
around the entrance and would reach in and, and bring back a pail just like this with some combs. So not not too far into our past, what would be hunting be wasn't wasn't for honey was important. Okay, but we don't need to go bee hunting today for honey. So why why should one? Why what's the, what's the attraction? Well, it's because it's a fascinating outdoor recreational activity. It's done out of doors. You know that's always fun. Requires no costly equipment, unlike beekeeping. <laughs> Can be played alone or in a group. Demands skill and persistence. And it's one of these things, it's it's like if you're a hunter, you know it can build suspense. And then this kind of hunting, it ends either in a harmless disappointment, you just didn't find the bee tree, or an exhilarating triumph. And uh, the reason it's an exhilarating triumph is you found the one tree in a stand of woods that the bees are living in. That's a, it's not a minor feat. Plus, last but not least, it's a great way great way to watch the behavior of individual bees and and i emphasize this when you know we all know that when we're doing our beekeeping we can't really focus on individual bees sometimes we focus on the queen and the workers around the queen but generally not generally we're focused on the the whole colony and its condition what it's doing how much comb it's built what it's got stored what the brood pattern is but in bee hunting you're looking at individual bees and you get to watch them closely. Yeah, in fact, you have to. Let me give you an example of a, of a bee hunt that I conducted. And actually, this is the house I'm in. <laughs> what the house that's shown here is the house I'm in right now. <laughs> and it's up in a little town called Pembroke, Maine. It's, it's about as far east in North America as the United States as you can get. Uh, go, go about... 10 miles north, you're in Canada. Anyhow, that's where that's where I have this camp up here, little house. And I did a bee hunt back in August, and I went over to this field next, my field by the house here. And it was, uh, it was at the end of the goldenrod season, but there was still enough goldenrod in bloom that I could find some honeybees. And this hunt led me from this spot by my house across the river. This is, this is about a mile wide river. It's actually a uh what's the right term i don't know it's where the sea comes in so it goes up and down with the tides and it, i found my way over to bee tree on the other side of the river let me go through it step by step step one <clears throat> was here in the field with the goldenrod and you and there's a little table here and a very important tool is the folding lawn chair and i've caught some bees off the goldenrod and i've introduced them to a little square of comb in which i put sugar syrup free lunch of sugar syrup. And it's just a, a square, about an inch and a half by an inch and a half of old, old, dark old comb, so the cells are really sturdy. And you can see these bees had, they were, even though the goldenrod flow is on, there's not that much goldenrod up there. So they were really eager to take this, to take this good food that I was providing. And then next step is I, once I figured out, like once I got bees coming and going from my little feeding station, the little comb there, I saw in what direction they flew home. And that is called determining the bee, their bee line. And that takes a little practice, but after, and at first when the bees fly home, they circle around, they circle, 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 and it's hard to see exactly which direction they're going. But once they've made a few trips to and from your little comb of sugar water, um, they, they zoom off in a direct line. Then it's easy to see where they're going. That you've determined their bee line then. And in this case, uh, and I, to my dismay, the bees were flying across the river. I was hoping they were flying over the fields around in the other direction, but nope, they went across the river. And I got a compass, got read with my compass, took their, the bearings of the, their flights, and I learned that their bee line pointed 47 degrees east of north, so basically northeast. I think you can see that this is, I hope you're getting a sense, a clear sense already that this is different from beekeeping because you don't know, you know when you're, when we're doing our beekeeping, we know where the bee's home is, but we don't know where they're foraging. And this is just the other way around. We know where they're foraging and the, on these flowers, but we don't know where their home is. <laughs> so that's why it's kind of fun to do it um, from the, the perspective of a beekeeper. So at this point, I labeled 10 bees. And what I reason I did this, and I labeled them for individual identification because I wanted to measure their 
away times, how long it took them to leave the comb, go home, unload, and come back. And I learned that the shortest away times were about eight minutes. And as I'll explain in a little bit, this, this revealed that the bee tree was about three quarters of a mile away. I'll explain how I know that. At this point, I put the syrup-filled comb with bees on it inside the bee box. I tied the bee box up tight, shut with some flagging, as you can see. Then I moved down the bee line, which in this case meant crossing the river. And then I released the bees. Well, fact is I overshot vastly. I went way too, I went way beyond the bee tree on the other side of the river. So I, when I let out the bees, the bees were flying back in the direction that I brought them from. So somewhere in between was the, was their home. And so here's my feeder. I reestablished it in the woods, as you can see. And it's this is the woods up here are thick spruce and spruce and fir um, forests and some birch in them. And it's pretty thick, lots of moss. So then I had to just all I could do is move the feeder closer and closer back in the direction that they were that they were flying off now uh, down the bee line until the away times it were only two minutes in other words i was getting so close eventually i got so close that it the bee would once she loaded up she'd fly off she'd be away very for only two minutes and you know, you probably know if you've watched bees unloading a nectar in the high, in a hive, an observation hive, it takes them about a minute to offload the nectar. So these bees were flying to and needed only a minute to fly home, home and then back. 30 second flight took them home. So, but still, it wasn't easy to find this tree because the woods were so thick. And what I, at this point, basically I had to conduct a tree to tree search until I discovered their home. And it was this dead, Dead white pine up on a ledge here. And here's what the entrance of their home was, the front door of this colony's home. And you can see it was a it was a healthy colony, as indicated by this bee, flying in with loads of goldenrod pollen, <laughs> bright orange goldenrod pollen. So that's that's an example of a bee hunt. I hope I hope you've hope this is giving you some feeling for it. And now what we'll do is we'll look more closely at how the process works. Oh, I forgot, I had this summary. How long did it take me to find this bee tree? It took me a day and a half, and the distance was very close to what I had estimated from the away times, 0. 0.72 miles. And this may sound strange, maybe even weird, but when you find the bee tree, it's a real thrill, it's thrilling because it's a natural treasure hunt. You have no idea where the bee's home is. I mean, you have some idea. It's somewhere over in the woods on the other side of the river in this case, but there's there's hundreds, there's thousands of trees over there and you can find it. And so it, it's, 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 I, it's probably one of the biggest highs in my life is whenever I find a bee tree by bee lining. Okay. Um, let me pause here, and I don't know if we can do questions. I just want to I want to check in and, and make sure that what I've said so far is has been clear. So is that is that possible, or should I just wait until the end? Can you hear us? I can hear you. Yes. We have a mic too, so I can run the mic around. Hey Tom, what's the uh, the uh, speed of the bee calculated point seven two? I'm not that interested in flying, but pretty miles per hour. Uh, the flight speed of a bee, you know, I, yeah. I should note that offhand. It's um. Oh, it depends on whether she's loaded or not. The, tr the flight home takes longer than the flight back when she's empty. Uh, we'll come back. That's a really important and question, and I will come back to that because I think it's going to come up later in the talk. I, I just can't pull up the number right, right offhand. Sorry. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. Thanks. 
second question, how did you catch the bee? How did you catch the bee? Yeah. And how many did you use? Yeah, you use about a dozen and you, um, and I'll show you how to catch them and mark them next. So in fact, I'll jump into that now because both of your questions really lead into what, what follows. Thank you. Okay, outline of the talk. Bee box, I'll talk about the bee box and other tools, the bee hunting season, how you establish a bee line, which is, involves catching some bees off the flowers, uh, as was asked, then determine its direction to the home, to the bee's home, whoops. It's, and then I'll explain how you can time the bees to estimate the distance to their bees' home and, and estimate the di distance quite accurately, make, and how you make moves down the bee line, and finally, how you search for the bee tree. So it's, I don't know, if those of you that are hunters, deer hunters, for example, you'll get it. There's just a lot of elements of the craft, and you, if you get it right, things go well. Um, and I'll mention it now, but if you're interested in following up from this talk, I did write a book on this called Following the Wild Bees, The Craft and Science of Bee Hunting. Well, tools, what are the tools you use? The, the primary tool you use is this thing called the bee box, and it's just a device that enables you to um, capture bees and introduce them to a, a good food source. It's a, the one that I use, and it's pretty conventional, is it's a box where at one end, you've got a door that you can open and close. You've got a partition in the middle. It's a sliding divider. You can raise it and lower it. And in the back, the back wall of the bee box is a window. It has a clear window, but also has a shutter that you can slide or cover that you can slide down over the window. And you'll see why you want to have this This is a device. Bee, bee hunters have got various forms of it, but this is a really good design. It's not mine. It's one I learned about. And there's a, there, the, you can buy them even. And there's a company in New York State called Hudson Valley Bee Supply. They sell them under their tools section. So you've got, you need a bee box. Here's a close up, closer picture of mine with a uh, front door that slides, slips open or folds open is here. And this one with the sliding window is back here and a divider. Okay, what you also need is two squares of old comb, but you can see the size, about two by two or inch and a half by inch and a half, a medicine dropper, because you're going to want to be able to pull sugar syrup out of your jar here and then drop it down into the cell so that you know, the dropper enables the cells to actually fill up, not just have it sit on the top. Um, the sugar syrup, I always sent mine with anise, I don't or the licorice smell. I don't know why. It is why anise is so effective, but it is it is a scent that the bees learn very well. I think they smell it very well, and it works very well. I've tried uh, using other scents in my bee hunting, orange and lemon and peppermint. Nothing touches anise as a scent for marking a food source. And you'll need also an opaque cloth. I just use an old, old uh, piece of felt. So... Two squares of comb, a medicine dropper, jar of anise scented sugar syrup, opaque cloth, and a bee box. Now, there's other stuff you can bring that are is is useful, but is optional. Things like paint pens, if you want to label individual bees, so you can time individuals. A, a compass. I find a com I always take a compass because where I go bee hunting, I could get lost. Uh, <laughs> we've got a lot of woods back here east, and there's a lot you can, you can get really turned around in the woods. Um, a topo map is helpful, so also to help for getting lost and then flagging. If you want to go deep in the woods, it's nice to be like Goldilocks and leave some, uh, was it Goldilocks, three bears? I don't know. Somebody was dropping crumbs to find her way home. That was Hansel. And... Anyhow, flagging can mark your trail so you can find your way home. And I use, I also bring along a little table and a, fo and a folding lawn chair because I find it easier to do the labeling of the bees once they're visiting the comb. If I can sit down and have the have my bee box at a, a sort of almost desk height. Next question, next topic, when to do it? What is a good bee, what is the bee hunting season? Well, it's, it's unlike if you're a deer hunter, it's whenever you can find bees on flowers. Um, you can go bee hunting anytime. 
But not every time you can find bees on flowers is ideal. Now, let me explain. My personal favorite time of the year to go bee hunting is the goldenrod bloom that we have here in fall. We have so much abandoned farmland. And what that farmland does is it goes, the first stage of its growing back to brush and forest is goldenrod. So there's plenty of plenty of wildflowers to find honeybees on. And then once you've, so once you've found a good place where you think you can, where you think you're away from other beekeepers, hot apiaries, for example, um, go there, look for bees. And now what do you do? Well, now the next step is to establish the bee line. And you do that using your bee box. Uh, and I should say that you can bee hunt in all sorts of places. It can be an urban setting. I've done it in urban, suburban, or rural. And the place that, one place that I did it was urban was in this, on a university campus where I caught bees near a church on that campus. And I didn't know where they were going, but just by chance, there was the wild colony bees was living in a building just across the courtyard here. That was fun. Um, and ideally, you want to go some, uh, ideally, you want to go someplace where you're well away from beekeepers' hives. Now, this is a talk I just recently gave for some Scottish beekeepers, so I was giving them su suggestions, maybe the Exmoor National Park or the Scottish Highlands, something like that. I'm not, uh, but really, any wild place where you're think you'll probably be away from beekeepers hives is a good place to go bee hunting but even if you're even if you are near beekeepers hives it's still fun to get the line going and discover oh yeah there's an apiary over there that i didn't know about and what do you do once you've chosen your site and you've got your equipment together got your equipment together and chosen your site you go to the flowers some flowers you find honeybees on them and you capture a bee in your box and what you do is you just basically slam the door shut you put the you put the box the opening of the box which has the which has the uh, hinged door you put that over the flower with the bees and then you slam it shut that's that's my technique and once you've got a bee in the front chamber of the box you raise the divider and so she wants to escape she flies up to the window that's in the rear compartment and then you can drop the divider back in place and she's trapped then in the rear compartment. That's what the bee box is really all about. It's just a way to capture a bunch of bees in one inside a box and then introduce them to a comb filled with sugar syrup. So yes, as I say, after trapping several bees in the rear compartment, put a syrup filled square of comb in the front compartment and then you raise the divider and you cover the box with an opaque cloth. And the reason you cover the box with an opaque cloth is the poor bees are freaked out. They're trying to escape. And bees, like every creature, when they want to escape, they go to the light. So if you darken and the light, there will be light leaking in wherever the wherever there's the door opens a little bit, there's a crack and there's a crack where this middle window divider is. But you put a opaque cloth over your bee box gets dark then the bees walk around quietly and then they'll sooner or later they'll bump into your comb filled with sugar syrup and then no worker bee can resist good sugar syrup they will load up and then they'll be ready to go home i wait for five minutes let the bees feed on the sugar syrup for five minutes then let the bees out and watch them fly away and hope that some will come back and the reason they don't, you have to hope that some will come back is because it's not guaranteed. And why isn't it guaranteed? Well, the bees will come back if they can't, if there's not much forage available. But if you're, if it's in the, if you're trying to bee hunt in the middle of a honey flow, they will not come back. And the reason they don't come back always is because basically what you're set, what you're the situation you're creating is, is a situation for these bees of robbing because they're taking food from a comb. And that, that happens in nature when they rob. And bees aren't dumb. They know that robbing is dangerous. So they only rob when there's no forage, natural forage to collect. So that's why I say hope that some come back. So hope that there's so little natural forage available at the time that they will come back. 
And it is an anxious wait because you don't know if they will or they won't. But usually, if you if you especially if you avoid uh, times when there's plentiful natural forage, usually some do come back. And here we have a bee that's come back. She's slurping up, imbibing the sugar syrup from a comb. And now, and I, I really want to emphasize, now that bee is your bee, because the fact that she came back and is loading up at your comb tells you that she really wants that food. She really wants that food. And she will keep coming for days and days and days, as long as she, the rest of the day she lives, unless you shut down the feeder or, which, or, or you lose her in the process of the bee hunting. And again, if, unless there's a honey flow on, those first bees that you introduce to the comb will recruit their nest mates. And this is, a, this is an extreme example of that. This was during a dearth and uh, in August. And yes, the first bees that were introduced to this comb, they danced like crazy. I like the, I like the way this photograph shows how these bees come in. They're landing, they put down their legs, kind of like putting down the landing gear here, here, here. <laughs> And so they can get it into the comb. And it's all these bees came from one colony, so there was no fighting among them. That was nice. Now, I'm going to pause again and see if if there are questions, because I want to make because getting the line established is really is a little tricky, and I want to sure let's make sure I I explained it clearly. Hey, Tom. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm just curious how often do you end up with bees from multiple colonies at your initial capture there? Oh, that's a that's a good question. Uh, usually, I I don't worry about it. Usually, the bees the, because the bees usually rarely do they do I see them fighting because there's so much food to go around. And what I do then is if I've got say two bees flying off in two directions, I just figure out which of the two bee trees is the closest? In other words, I'm by, I get some of these away times, how long it took them to fly, fly off and come back. And I'll just, then I'll start moving down the line towards the, the nearer of the two trees. And little by little, the bees, the you'll get more and more bees from the, the bee tree that you're moving towards and fewer and fewer from the tree that you're moving away from. Thank you for asking that question because it does happen <laughs> for sure. Yeah. I just want to let you know that we have about less than 10 minutes for our next. Oh, okay. We'll move right along then. You yep. Sounds like a good plan. Now you want to label some bees for individual identification with paint marks. Then you start noting the direction they fly home, their bee lines. And I, I keep a notebook and I, I have a compass so I can see. I saw in this case, most of the bees were flying towards the south southwest. Then I time the bees to estimate the distance to their home. So I note, I've got individuals labeled. They notice when that when that bee leaves, when she comes back. So that gives me the away time. And I, here's the... Oh, okay. I will, I will not speak quite so rapidly. <laughs> yes, that is on me. I do have a question. So I have a mic and I want them to. Okay, let's take that question. Mm -hmm. um, so I do have a question for you. I thought about the technique a lot. I've had a master student uh, pilot this technique when they were going to work in South Africa. And I have a PhD student in South Africa. We don't care right now. Mm -hmm. Let's see why we don't. In fact, she texted me every day. So I'm excited. And our approach has been kind of a sloppy hog approach where we just have a few little bill culture or sits, track hundreds of thousands of bees, and then we penalize the top of it. But I've always wanted to ask. Would there be advantages to be lines the I'm not sure. And partly I'm having trouble um, in answering that because for some reason the microphone isn't 
picking up your voice clearly. I'm not hearing your words as as clearly as to so that I can understand them well. Um, can you can you say the question again? Yeah, I'm at the computer now. Can you hear me? Yes, that's good. Okay, so what, what I was telling you is I have a uh, so we filed in using the Vbox years ago with a student of mine who was stuck in beans in South Africa. Yeah. And then I've got a PhD student over there literally right now texting every day and uh, some stuff. We don't use the Vbox method, we use kind of what I call a slop in your hides method where you just plant a feeder, kill it from the shoot, and feed it from DR and drop the dog. Oh. Well, you could try you could try both at the same time, but the reason I use a bee box is that um, where I when I go bee hunting, the bees are are they prefer to go to flowers than to some weirdo foods artificial food source. So I kind of have to. I have to introduce them to the artificial food source and help them discover that what I'm offering really is good and really is safe. So that that's why I use the bee box. Um, but yeah, sometimes you could you can just put out a comb, leave it out for the for a while, and 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 a bee will find probably will find it unless there's a honey flow on. That would be another way to do it. Yep. It's also fun to. It's kind of fun to build a bee box. It's kind of fun to capture the bees off the flower, so, <laughs> that sort of stuff. I guess if you like to just, yeah. And also if, if in some cases it could be faster to use the bee box because you can really quickly and directly introduce bees to your comb. You don't, you don't have to wait for them to find it. You've found them. Okay. How often, I, okay. how often yeah. do you beeline and found yourself at a managed depot oh not very often because i um that's happened when i was a beginner that happened a lot and then i learned to go to go out to places where i uh which were not suburban settings out deep into more, more uh, wider wider forested areas rural areas um and when i do that then yeah then i don't then i don't i haven't very rarely do I get into a beekeeper's hive, led back to a beekeeper's hive. But I'm but I'm glad you asked that question because um, it's fun to even if you end up at a, an apiary, uh, which I did a lot when I was a beginner. That was still that was still fun because I didn't I didn't know about all these apiaries in, around where I lived. So that was that was good. Either way, it was it was good experience. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think if did I hear the question question whether was the question one molar or two molar syrup? Oh, oh yeah, the syrup, yes, yeah, syrup. Yeah, you could uh, a one to one, volume to volume, one cup sugar and one cup boiling hot water. You mix those up, that would make you a, a very good syrup for bee hunting, and and then you want to put in a drop of. In my case, I would put in a, one drop of anise extract. And I use a canning jar because it has a good seal, good tight lid with a seal so you don't get doesn't leak and you don't get everything gooped up with sugar, with your sugar syrup. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? Sounds like not. Here's an example of just a, a photograph I took from my notebook of where I had labeled bees for, with two paint marks. This bee, one bee was yellow, yellow, another was green, green, green thorax, yellow, ob, orange, green, orange, et cetera, et cetera. And you could see that for each bee, I could only do one bee at a time, really, but I would, I would note when that bee, yellow, yellow, departed. 9.55 and 30 seconds when she returned, 10.05 and 30 seconds. So that she was away for 10 minutes. And I noted the angle she flew off. That's 184 degrees relative to north. And um, 
Various other bees did this. But I'm going to focus, as we look at this table, I'm going to focus on the bee yellow orange. And the reason I have highlighted the bee yellow orange was that she was the speedster of this group. Her first round trip, she was only away for six minutes, 20 seconds. None of this 10 minutes, 11 minutes, 15 minutes stuff. For her, it was six minutes, 20 seconds. <laughs> And then on her second trip back, well, she was a little, took a little longer, eight minutes, 20, but that still was on the, on the short time, short side of things. And then she made a trip where she was only away for six minutes and five seconds, exclamation mark. And that told me that, that, that gave me the best estimate of, of the distance. And so I, I locked in. So I, that's what I learned from her. And I'll explain that knowing that six minutes and five seconds or six minutes down here, that told me how far away the nest was, her net, her home was. Because and at this point, that's useful. I'll come back to that. Let's see if I've got that. No. Yeah, it, that told me that that bee tree was less than a mile away. It was probably only about a half a mile away. And, and so we'll see that was the case. So now... Now you know the direction of your bee, like that bee, yellow orange. She was flying off at 168 degrees, 169 degrees, 170 degrees. So I had a really clear sense of the of her bee, the direction of her bee line, and I knew that she wasn't. It was it was her sight was less than a mile away. So I knew the approximate direction. I knew the approximate distance, and then you start making moves down the bee line to zero in on the bee tree. And the way you move, that's what I want to explain now, is how you make these moves down the bee line. You put the comb, you put your comb with the sugar syrup and with bees on it, as many bees as you can, into the bee box. Then you close up the bee box with a bunch of bees inside. You want to get as many bees in that, have as many bees on the comb in your box as possible when you close it up. And now you move your operation Oh, 100, 300 yards down the bee line. Um, sometimes more, sometimes less. It depends on the circumstances. If it's an over open country, you could, you could, and you have a feeling that that bee tree is a mile away, you could, you could probably move it a tenth or a quarter of a mile. But here's an example where I was working in a place that was on the Cornell campus where there were a lot of landmarks. And so I couldn't make big moves. But so I'll walk you through how this bee hunt worked. I started at 12 o'clock capturing bees off flowers in a garden here. And the bees were flying off in this flying off in this direction. At least that's what it looked like to me. But I wasn't sure whether this was the right direction or something up here is the right direction, because there's this really tall building here. And the bees, I figured the bees might be going up in this direction, but we're just flying around it. So I moved my I moved the feeding station with the bees to this location, and then it became crystal clear. These bees were zooming straight north. And so step by step, I moved, I moved the feeder here with the bees, and then I, and I moved them here. I was about a half an hour or so at each of these locations, and then to here, and then to here. And then it, um, when I got to this point, it was the bees were only needing about a minute to fly to the home, to their home and then come back. So I knew their, their, their home, which was a tree, was somewhere nearby. So I just searched down the bee line and I found at 440, I found the bee tree. And this is, what's, this is what I found. It was a big red oak here. The bees were flying in and out of a, of a where a branch had broken off and the decay had, had gone down in the knot hole there. And the bees were living up there. So that was, uh, you might say, well, that was a lot of time, four hours and 40 minutes. Yeah, it was a lot of time, but it, you, you do this just for the fun of it. <laughs> and so, because it, it, it's fun to be outdoors. It's fun to watch bees as individuals. And it's fun to to face the challenge of, of tracking them back to their home. And I have to tell you, there's not, I, I've had a lot of, you know, pleasurable things in my life, but for some reason, and maybe I'm weird. Well, I know I'm weird, but... <laughs> It, for me, it's a real, it's a special thrill to finally find this bee tree. Because after all, you've been, you've been wondering where it is, where it is. You know, the bees are going up in this direction, and you're starting to imagine, well, is it in a building or is it where is it? And then finally, you find it. And often, 
this last step of finding the actual entrance can be the trickiest because it's it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to spot the entrance. So when you do, it's a big thrill. Hey, Tom? Yeah. Uh, as an engineer, I would move one block to the right and try and frame it. Does that not work? Uh, these coming back down that original path or really I move to the right and then triangulate Would that still work? Yeah, and thank you for asking that. Sometimes I do that if I, um, uh, yeah, to get two beads, two lines on it. And then, because sometimes, I'll, I think I'll give you an example later in this talk where I did exactly that because I just couldn't find, I couldn't find the entrance. So what I did is I did just what you said. I, I backed off. I got the, the, the flight, the, the, the direction that the bees were flying home from a different angle. And it still, and it led me to this, it confirmed that it was somewhere where I had been looking, but I hadn't seen the right place. And it was because it was way in the tippy top of a big tall pine tree and I just couldn't see it at first. So yeah, that I'm, I'm glad you, I'm really glad you asked that question because there's not, there's lots of different ways to do this and you just have to figure out what, and just as you suggested, why don't you triangulate? Yeah, that that's another way to do it. That's another way. Sometimes, sometimes he re here's an extreme example of triangulation. You're so frustrated in finding the tree. You're not sure where it is. You'd make a big jump and then you hope the beeline reverses itself and it'll be clearer when you come back in the other direction. It's those of you that are deer hunters or you know that you, there's just a lot of little tricks you can use for uh, helping you with your hunting. So this was the bee tree. Uh, some, I was going to say, sometimes the bee tree is obvious, like this one wasn't very high, the entrance wasn't very high off the ground, and it was stained with propolis all around the entrance, which the bees do in the wild. Um, and here, but this one was, uh, this was up in a poplar tree, and it was, it was probably 30 feet up, maybe more. So that one was a little trickier, but it was still out in the open, so it wasn't that hard to spot. But, so that was the finding of the bee tree. Yes, question? When you make a move, say a couple hundred yards uh, toward where you, where you think you're flying, you run into a situation where you make that move and uh, all of a sudden there's no bees coming back to you? Yeah. <laughs> but it, yeah, you're, you're, really, you're really in tune with how this works. Right. Sometimes you overshoot. And when they overshoot, they often do not come back or they come back very slowly. And that is telling you that, oh, something, I, I overdid it. <laughs> and so you just, what, but the good thing is it's easy to fix that problem because if you go back to the last place where you offered the food, where you had the feeding table set up, there's going to be bees buzzing around that place. And so you can restart the line presto. Thanks for asking that question because you're highlighting some of the the um, some of the uh, tricks of the of the whole process. Yeah, and but in a way, you know, if that doesn't if the if they don't come back, that tells you you've got to you've narrowed it down where they are. And when you start looking for the entrance, if you're in a forest situation, and I guess I don't know if in, probably this doesn't relate to your situation, but we got to forest is our main land land cover natural land cover here um it's usually a knot hole some and usually most often more often than not it's high off the ground and that's because there are bears here and the bees bears don't find if they find a, if there's a bees nest close to the ground the bears will find their entrance easily if it's higher up in the ground it's less easy they they don't so you look up you look high, you look low, you look everywhere, and more often than not, at least where I am, the entrance is, is high off the ground. But sometimes the entrance is low. The bees were flying in and out of the roots of this bee tree, which was right at ground level. So you have to look, you, know, you look high, you look low, you look everywhere. It depends. It's a very important question. <laughs> Thank you for asking that. More often than not, probably nine times out of 10, maybe 
19 times out of 20. I just, I just, I keep make it, put it in my notes. I don't do anything with the bee tree. I don't want the honey. It's so much, it's a lot of work to get honey out of a bee tree. But what I do know is I know that I'm going to put, if I want to capture wild swarms, I'm going to put up a bait hive somewhere not too far from that bee tree, maybe a hundred yards away, something like that. So um, that's the main way that I take it. That's the main use that I make of finding the bee tree. But my main motivation for doing this is the sheer pleasure of just finding, of going through the hunt. You know, it's like uh, the thrills in the chase, not in the kill, something like that. So it it's it's it taps into it really taps into one's hunting instincts or pleasures. I want to show you this little video. I hope it will work. I hope the internet connection's fast enough. Because when you're near, when you're spotting the entrance, what you're actually looking for, what you're most likely to see is bees buzzing around on the side of a tree. Here's an example of where they were, where you can see this. I hope that's coming through clearly enough. That's very eye-catching. You know, our eyes are very good at detecting motion. So it's the it's the flight activity of the bees going in and out of their nest entrance is what usually catches my eye. Now, next section. Well, we, we looked at this photograph earlier on about these bee hunters taking up the bee tree. It's a funny expression, isn't it? Taking up the bee tree, when often it means cutting down the bee tree. Oh, and as a side note, here's a little, oops, a little fun question for those of you that like trees. What kind of tree is this? What kind of tree does that look like? Remember, this was take, this was a drawing made in the 1800s. Did somebody say elm and did somebody say chestnut? Yeah. The person who said chestnut has a good eye for trees. This is a chestnut tree. Yeah, that's right. It's a so boy, that's good. Not many people get that one because we don't see many chestnut trees these days. So I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna make some thoughts, share some thoughts about why not to take up the bee tree. Well, I'll confess. I took up, cut down, 21 bee trees in my 20s. And I did so not to get honey, but to study the natural nests of honeybees. And that was scientifically was important because we actually, remarkably, we knew nothing about the natural nests of honeybees uh, until that study was done back in the 1970s. So I took up 21 bee trees in my 20s, but now I discourage it. And why do I discourage it? It's because, the, primarily it's because wild honeybee colonies can be a genetic resource because nobody is caring for them. There's very strong selection on them to be tough, good at overwintering, resistant to mites and, and other diseases like chalk brood. And that's what I find and that's what has been my experience. And I could talk for hours on this, that these colonies I pull out of the woods, they know all about mites. They don't have chalk brood um, and um, sometimes they're sometimes they're a little ornery, but usually they're not, um, and they overwinter well. They know how to they know how to um, deal with really long cold winters. So that's one. That's probably the primary reason why you don't want to take up the cut down the the bee tree. And secondly, I would say there's a much better way to get wild colonies of honeybees if if that's what you're seeking. And that's what I do seek now because they are bees that have gone through selection for, for resistance to Varroa. I use bait hives to trap swarms. And I'm like, if you'd like something, I'll give you a whole, I'll give you a talk on bait hives. Or maybe that's later today. Is that on the schedule? Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> maybe. So um, those are my two reasons why I don't cut down bee trees. I want those wild colonies to live on. And here's why I recommend bee hunting just as a purely recreational activity. For one thing, it connects us with the beauty and the mysteries of nature, because you have a lot of time when you're sitting there waiting for the bees to come back to your feeding station or whatever. 
or while you're just out trying to get the line established, we get to look around and see things, see what's going on in the natural world. So it's a lot like bird watching. But you know, the nice thing about doing this bee hunting, the bees are a lot easier to see because they're coming to your little feeding station, your little comb filled with the sugar syrup. So you can easy to see them up close. And there's no risk of being stung when you're doing when you're doing the bee hunting. They're not they're not in danger. They're 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 just intent on getting the goodies that you're providing. So you can get up close to them, watch them to your heart's consent. And and as I say, if you label them for individuals, you get to know them as individuals. Um, some some are nervous, some are bold. Some make trips back and forth quickly. Some take a lot of time, and I don't know what they're doing with all that time. <laughs> Is maybe they're old and, and need a rest or something. Um, so you get to really know bees from an individual at an individual level. And another reason I recommend bee hunting as a recreational activity is it 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 connects us with organisms we cannot live without. We all know that Apis mellifera is our most important pollinator, and so it's I think it's it's nice to see how these bees just to get kind of in closer touch with them. At, it's particularly at the individual level. And I think I, this last point isn't relevant for beekeepers, but if I give this talk to people that aren't beekeepers, I, I explain this as a way to engage with, with the bees and it helps motivate us all to keep the world healthy for them. And I think that might be my last slide. No, this is my last slide. <laughs> just my I just wanted to say thank you for your, your interest and attention. And if there are more questions, We've got time, and I'd be happy to happy to go through the questions. For a novice beekeeper, how do you mark your bees? The way I mark them is I. I get little paint brushes, tiny little paint brushes. They're they're sold in art art supply places, um, and they're um, and when they're eating their food, when they're at your comb, and they're drinking up the sugar syrup, they are they're pretty oblivious to most everything else. So you can, with practice, and using a very fine paintbrush, you can put a you can put a daub of paint on the on the thorax of the bee. And if you're really skilled, you can get it onto the abdomen too without it getting onto the wings. And sometimes you can put two or three colors on the, on the thorax. So you can really make lots of combinations. So that's, that's how I do it. The key thing is to do it when the bees are slurping up your sugar syrup because then they're standing perfectly still. Thanks for asking the question. That's an important question. And it's not obvious. The answer is not obvious. You have a favorite paint that you use? I'm assuming you're using bottle paint, right? Like test tubes or something? Yeah. Um, the, my favorite paint is, I get shellac at an artist's craft store, and I buy some artist pigments, and I mix up my own paint. Um, but, you know, what works really well is those little... I don't know if you can still find them, those little bottles of tester enamel, tester pla enamel. That works really well too. And when I use when I use that, um, I just take a long paper towel. So if I want, if I put paint on the brush, I just wipe and I don't want the brush to turn into a um, get stiff. I just wipe off the paint between times of using the paint. Um but uh, there's probably other, oh, some people use nail polish. That's another way to do it because those come with little brushes. So, oh, oh, and there are paint pens too, of course. A lot of the bee hunters I know, they like to use paint pens. Um, you know, the, what are they, I forget what company makes them, but there's the, you know, the things that the bee supply companies sell for marking queens, same, same, same tool, same paint system. But I find those are not as, a little harder to use than a little a tiny little brush. A tiny little brush holds the paint well and it's soft. The paint paint pens are you kind of have to push down on them. You got to make sure that the tip is wet with paint. Sometimes there's too much paint. So I use a little brush. That's my preferred method. Yeah, 
I'm sorry. I think you'll need to repeat that. Um, and if the microphone didn't pick that up very well. Have you kept track over time um, how long a beef uh, tree will remain active with bees in it? Yes, I have. Thank you very much for asking that question. And just as a bit of background, I'll explain that one of the reasons I go bee hunting is it has been important for me to have a population or a group of bee tree, wild colon bee tree colonies, wild colonies to monitor, to answer the very question that you have just asked. And here's what I find. Here's what I found. And I've done it twice, done this study twice in the 1970s and again in the 2000s. Um, in the wild, a colony that moves into a bee tree, its first winter is very risky. Only 20% of colonies will survive their first winter. And, you know, that's because they've had to move in and build combs and rear brood, and they don't always have much honey stored up. But if a colony gets through its first winter, its probability of survival is about 80%, um, sometimes a little higher, sometimes a little less. So it's they're not perfect, but that's that's how it works. And that's why the how the population keeps going to about 20% of the established bee tree colonies die out each year, and they are replaced by the 20% of the swarms that survive. So that, that's what keeps the population stable in the, in the part of New York, the, the forested part of New York State where I live. Yeah. Was there a difference between the two study periods? Um, yeah, no I, was, no, I was surprised. You know, I did the first study before Varroa came here. And I didn't do it thinking that Varroa was going to come and I wanted that baseline. But I did it in the 70s. And then I went back in the 2000s. I've forgotten what year it was. Maybe it was 2010s. And I should know that. Um, and I was flabbergasted, actually flabbergasted to find that the colonies in the wild were surviving as well as they, with Varroa, as they were surviving without Varroa. And the reason I know that even the colonies up in the woods, up in the forests had Varroa is because I would put up bait hives and if the colonies would move into bait hives onto combs, uh, these would be these bait hives would be Langstroth hives. I could check them for Varroa. And all of those colonies, every colony in that forest that I caught in my bait hives in the 2000s had Varroa. And so, and they um, they still have varroa, but they control the varroa. And in fact, we did a we did a study. Uh, we looked at. I worked with this geneticist, a student that was a very sophisticated population geneticist named Sasha Mikheyev, and I had collected honeybees back from the wild colonies back in the 1970s, and I told him about that, and he said, "Well, gosh, Tom." Let's go collect some bees now from the 2010s and let's look at their genetics. And what he found was his genetic analysis revealed that that population of colonies, wild colonies in the woods around Ithaca, New York, went through a real, went through a big population crash at some time in between. And that's because they lost a lot of their genetic diversity. And that probably, and Sasha estimates that only maybe only 10% of the wild colonies survived the arrival of Varroa, but then the population rebuilt itself. It's pretty amazing what, what, what Sasha learned from that genetic analysis. They call that going through a genetic bottleneck because they lost a lot of their genetic diversity. And interestingly, you might be interested to know that the wild colonies in the forest, they're a real, they're, they're a mongrel bee. They're somewhat, they have some of their, they're primarily um, of Italian, uh, Apis mellifera lagustica and Apis mellifera carnica, the, two, the German black bee and the, and the uh, Italian bee. But there's also some of the old, old Apis mellifera mellifera genetic makeup in these bees. Um, and then there's also the, um, what's the fourth big popular subspecies in North America? Caucasica, there's a large, large component of Caucasian honeybee in these wild bees.
Yeah. Well, and I, I should say too that where I go do this bee hunting, until recently, there were no beekeepers hives in the area. And that's probably part of why the selection was so strong on these bees. And um, now one bee, there, now that that forest area where I where I did the bee hunting, the Arnott Forest, has become kind of popular for beekeepers in the area to put out uh, to put out mating nukes, and um, and because they want to tap into that genetics. I'm not. I have to confess, I'm not entirely happy with that because that messes up the genetics in the area if they leave the colonies there. But that's that's the way it is. What's the uh, longest beeline you've followed? <laughs> oh, let me think. Let me think back for a second. Hmm, it was a long one. What? Yeah. What was the longest bee line that I followed back and found the tree? Usually, it's less than a mile. But I, I can't. My memory's not as good as it used to be. But I, I do remember there was an, there was one. Uh, it probably was a good two miles. It was, it was a, it was an area uh, where I wasn't start. I wasn't going through deep forest. I remember it started on the edge of the, at the edge of Cornell's forest in an open area. Actually, it was in a. Uh, a cemetery, and then it, I went deep, deep, deep into the forest. Yeah, that was, uh, was that was the longest. It was it was between one and two miles. And usually, I don't try if I if I don't get a if I don't get bees coming back, making round trips that are less than ten minutes. I usually don't I don't persist. But on this in this particular case, for some reason, whatever, I did persist. And uh, so yeah, that would that was probably the longest one. Yeah, the shortest. What was the and the other extreme? What was the shortest? The shortest might have been, I don't know, holding out about a hundred yards. <laughs> that was a fun one. Bees were right there. And the, you might ask, how? What was the longest? How longest in terms of time? There was one bee tree, and I write about this in my book, um, following the wild bees. There was one bee tree that took me two years to find. I started it one summer, and I went back. And they were the bees were flying up a steep hillside up through hemlock trees, and I just couldn't see where they were going. And I tried it again the next year, and then I tried it again a third year. And the third year, I was in the forest, and I was getting close. I because the, the bees weren't taking long at all to fly from my comb and go up to their home and then come back down. But again, it was deep in this old growth forest of hemlocks, and then. At one point, I got a phone call on my on my cell phone, and a student was calling me. So I was standing in one place, and while I was chatting with this student, I just just started looking around, and just as luck would have it, I was looking up through an opening in the trees, and I could see the bees. The sunlight was glinting off the wings of those bees as they were flying into down into their nest, down into the knot hole that was. That was their nest entrance. That was just an incredible stroke of luck. If I had stood 10 feet to the, the north or south or east or west from that particular spot, I would never have seen, looked up and seen that opening and seen those bees. So sometimes you get, sometimes you get lucky. <laughs> and that was the longest. That was in terms of time. That was, that was a good, that was a good two years to, total time. That sounds like that persistence you described at the beginning. Yeah, uh, it, <laughs> and you know, now that I look back at it, and I thank you for using the word persistence, I'm trying to figure out why on earth did I <laughs> did I think it was worth spending that much time? I think it was just the the intrigue or the challenge, something like that. Because I think I'm a pretty good I think I'm a pretty good bee hunter, but that, those bees had me skunked for and twice, and so I went back for one more try. <laughs> yeah. I'm not unfortunately I'm not hearing you very well. I'm sorry. Dr. Seeley here in Iowa. Can you hear me okay now? 
Perfect. Okay, in Iowa, it's been noted by several professionals that we do not have very many feral colonies. Yes, I, I, I was thinking that was probably the case. Yeah, and it's been said several times by very professional people in Iowa. So I don't think we have quite the opportunity here, <laughs> maybe, but, uh, but anyway, I just wanted to make sure that you understood that aspect. Let me let me ask you a question on that regard. You have do you have old farmhouses? We do. I find a lot of I when I do studies of wild colonies and I put an advert in the put adverts out to try to find wild colonies so I can study how well they're surviving. Then I'm not trying to find them always in the woods. Sometimes I want to find them in in um, built up areas. There are a lot of people with old farmhouses built in the 1800s. Call me. Because and they've got bees living up in the roof or just in a crack in the side of the walls, things like that, between the clobberts. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right. I do know of a, a feral colony in South Central Iowa that's in a corn crib, an old corn crib. Yeah. Like yeah. So it does occur occasionally. They're rare. I find them in old dairy barns too. We we have dairy barns around here, and so. I don't know what it is, but yeah, they 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 because they when they go into a building, I guess the building is so such good protection. They don't always need a complete enclosure; just something that's really well gives them good shelter. Can I piggyback off that? Um, I went hiking with my friends, and I don't know if you guys know where like Aquabi is, but I found three beehives out there in trees. So it's possible. It's possible. Oh. That's good. You must have good eyesight. How did tell us how you found them? Just by chance noticing them, or did you hear them, or or what? They were pretty active. It was July, so um, they're pretty active. But most of them, um, me or my sister saw, and they're like, "Oh, how do you do this?" And we yeah. just like enjoying nature. We were seeing what we could saw while we were talking. So yeah. yeah. How high were the entrances? Um, one was pretty long. It was like um, kind of curvy, and um, the other one was pretty tall, but they were all kind of low. So I don't know if yep. you just got like we don't have yeah. bears. Yeah. I do that too. <laughs> don't have bears. Oh, of course. You know that's a whoever said that. That's a very relevant point. I bet it is selection to resist to avoid getting detected by black bears that has favored their nesting high up. And I, once I had a bee tree up in the Cornell Zarnot Forest, and I was checking it three times a year as part of a study. And I came back one, one spring, and the tree had been blown over. This big red oak tree had been blown over. And before I had gotten there, the bees were all over the entrance. And, but they couldn't get into that, that sturdy oak tree. So yeah, as soon as, that, as soon as that wild colony's nest got down to ground level, the bears learned about it. But fortunately, the bees were still safe. Yeah. Yes, bears do. Bears really like honey. It's not just Winnie the Pooh. It's real. It's the real deal. <laughs> Talking about bears and honey. Say, so, Tom, did you cover how you calculate uh, the distance uh, in time travel for the bees? You know, I, from yeah, I didn't, and I. If you send me an email, I'll send you a screenshot of the graph that's in the um, that's in the book. It's just an empirical line that I determined, though you can calculate it. Um, but I don't know how offhand. I, um, but if you send me an email to T as in Tom, D as in David, S as in Sam, and then the number five, numeral five, at cornell.edu. I will I will send you the information about that. I can send you a screenshot of that, and we and you can I, I can also give you the the equation. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. So, Dr. Keeley, are you doing any other current uh, research? Oh, or... yeah. Can you? I, I think what I think if I heard the question correctly, the question was something along the lines of what am I doing research on now? Um, thank you for asking that question. I, I, that I is the yes. question. Um, no, I just was questioning 
Are you doing any new research uh, currently, or are you continuing out with the things that you've been working on prior? I think there might be a democracy book and then uh, the book about uh, the finding following the wild bees. Are you doing anything new going forward here? Oh, yeah. Since doing the stuff that I talked about in Honeybee Democracy, I spent a lot of time analyzing a lot of different signals, mechanical signals that the honeybees use. These were things that have names like the buzz run and um, piping, worker piping, um, things like that. And I, um, so I, I was focusing my attention on analyzing more of the mechanical behavioral communication signals of, of honeybees. And I've, I've just written a little book, um, well, it's 20 chapters, but the chapters are short, called Piping Hot Bee, Piping Hot, what is it called, Tom? Here, I've got it right here. Piping Hot Bees and Boisterous Buzz Runners. That's going to come out next spring. So that's, that was a, and then and that, that's a, that's, that book was written not for scientists at all. It was like Honeybee Democracy. It was written to share with with beekeepers, what we've learned, um, and uh, and have published in the scientific journals, but this by writing a book like this, like for Honeybee Democracy, it makes it makes the findings accessible to anyone, available and meaningful to anyone. So that's what I've been that's what I've been working on, mostly analyzing some of these obscure signals that people have seen for years and years and years, but have always wondered why is the bee doing that. These are things like as I mentioned, a dance called the tremble dance, and things like the also called the there's dorsal ventral abdominal vibration, all sometimes called the shaking behavior. People wonder why is the bee doing that, and then and so I spent a lot of time figuring answering those sorts of questions. And there is another book that I wrote in between called The Lives of Bees: The Untold Story of the Honeybee of Honeybees in the Wild, and that's a that's a quite a deep look at how bees live in the wild. Uh, and it, it, it's really, I wrote that book because I think it helps us be, helps us with our beekeeping to understand, to have a clear sense of how we've, we, what, how we alter the lives of bees and for better and sometimes for worse. For example, we, in the, in the wild, they live in a nest cavity that holds comb as a, about the amount of comb that's in one deep Langstroth ten frame hive body, and so they that's enough space for them to rear brood and store up honey to get through winter, but it's not so much space that they they make more honey than they need, and it's not so much space that they are disinclined to produce swarms. So it's that kind of thing that that book is about. It's called the Lives of Bees, and thank you for asking. And the reason I write these books is I. I don't want to have the information that I've learned, I and my students have learned, and others, uh, hidden away in the scientific journals. Because the people that often are most interested in this information are, are are fellow beekeepers. So the new one is called Piping Hot Bees and Boisterous Buzz Runner. Come out next spring, spring 2024. Oh, and I was going to say, if you, if, the, the thing that I'm focusing on personally of my main empirical interests are, are studies of hive insulation. I'm, I'm just, I know that the wild colonies have very good insulation. It's like having, it's a, the, the thickness of the walls of a, of a bee tree nest cavity is like having, it's about like having two inches of, of um, XPS foam on the outside of a hive. And I know that the preliminary findings are pretty revealing that it does, they are, for example, that if the hive is really well insulated in the winter, the bees don't even need to form a tight cluster and they can move around to, to, to get to honey easily because they're not having, they're not sort of frozen up in one part of the hive. So I think that, I think that's, that's something that is a message that I think is is going to be very important. And, I, and if, if you've been keeping bees in polystyrene hives, you've probably noticed that already, that the bees do really well in winter. Hope that answered the, that's a long answer to that short question. Sorry. I don't, I 
down in southern Iowa, we have a lot of barrel hives. We have a lot more golden hills, more trees. Uh -huh. and, uh, oak trees, cedar trees. Do you see a species of tree that the bees prefer more than others? Yeah, you know, I don't. I don't see any particular tree. And I, I've wondered about that. Um, probably the numerically, numer the most common species that is occupied in my neck of the woods is the red oak tree. But I, but they'll, they'll live in, I found them in everything. Um, conifers, hardwoods, and among the conifers, white pine, um, uh, hemlocks, uh, among the hardwoods, all of them, black walnuts, red maples, hard maples, you name it, red oak, white oak, uh, black locust. I think, I don't think the tree, the wood type or tree type matters to them. What does matter to them are the particulars of the, the size of the entrance, the height of the entrance, and maybe the thickness of the walls, the insulation, things like that. Can, can you talk a little bit about, for wild bee colonies, kind of the, the amount of space between hives, the hive density? <laughs> yeah, well, I can tell you a lot about that. Um, it's about the density of colonies in, in the forested areas back east here. It's about one wild colony per square kilometer, which works out to one 2.5 colonies per square mile. So they're not, they're not, they're not real abundant. And I think what keeps them what prevents them from living at high densities is there's where there's a lot of forest cover on the land, there's not much forage. There's episodic forage. If there are basswood trees that are in bloom, um, cherry trees, uh, so, uh, some of the others, there used to be chestnuts and those would be really good for the bees. Um, so I think if they're limited by the food supply, so the density is not high. We have a little less than 10 minutes, so if you have questions, now's your chance. Hold on. <clears throat> have, could you ask, could you poll, is the, has, it, has anybody in the group gone bee hunting? Has there, is there a bee hunter among the, among the, among the crowd? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> Great. Good. Yeah. One. Yeah. And I'd like to ask that gentleman, what what interested you to to do bee hunting? Uh, honestly, I saw a YouTube video with you describing it, and then I read your <laughs> book. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Yeah, it's a fun little book. It's out in paperback now. It's called uh, "Following the Wild Bees." I think it's like twelve bucks on Amazon. It's a good book. Fun read. You learn a lot about bees. You read a lot of stories. It's a perfect Christmas gift. Yeah, good Christmas. Hey, that's the spirit. Chris, they start thinking of Christmas presents. <laughs> yeah. What's the what's what's the weather like where where you are these right now? Is it? We had we had our first snow last night. What have, have you? You've had some already. Oh, not yet. The last two years during this conference, we've had snow. We are hoping not to have it this year. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Do you have a lot of migratory beekeepers that bring colonies into um, into Iowa? I don't really get as much into Iowa. I feel like we send them out. Yeah. I ask because I know that some beekeepers find that those, uh, well, we have a lot in New York State because we have they grow a lot of apples, so they need a lot of need for pollinators and uh, uh, the, and in Maine they bring a lot of up to pollinate the blueberries and uh, I guess they often can bring a lot of varroa with them. And if the colonies die out from varroa, then they get robbed out. Then the colonies do the robbing, get lots of varroa. That's that's the heart of the problem. Hi, uh, we first started this off. Uh, 
how long have you been explaining how you built a uh, box in which uh, that will sell them? Yeah, it's um, it's a little tricky the construction, but it's just basically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces of. I use quarter inch plywood to make it. Uh, no, that's not true. I use quarter inch plywood for everything but the two side boards. Those I use just three quarter inch pine. So. Yeah. But you can see it's a pretty small box. It's small enough to fit in my hand. It's, of course, um, yeah. it's, it's kind of a fun thing to build. And um, like I say, they, they, they do, different companies, I think, sell them on, on different beast supply places do sell them. There's some that are better than others. You want to get one that's fits in your hand well because you want to be able to hold it with one hand and slam the door shut with the other oh, when the when the bee is inside what kind of wax do you have on it to seal and close the door oh to keep the door closed i yeah. mine yeah mine is just a Kind of, you might say a friction fit, or it used to be a friction fit. Now, if I want to keep it closed, I just put a rubber band over the whole box and hold everything shut. <laughs> Holds that sliding divider in place as well as holding the front door shut. Pretty low tech, in other words. <laughs> I'm a pretty low tech scientist. Yeah. Okay, got about five minutes. Any more questions? What is the, what is, can I ask a question? What is, maybe I've, I might be repeating myself, but what is your biggest challenge? Is it, is it the mites or is it the overwintering or is it forage? Uh, what, what is, what are your biggest challenges to keeping bees? There's a lot of mites and then there's a lot of people saying, yes, all of it is a challenge. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how many of you were beekeepers before Varro was present, but it used to be really easy. It wasn't hard at all. <laughs> it's so much harder now with mites. Yeah. But there are, I have faith in the, in selection. Um, I know if I, the bees that I get out of the wild, they don't, they don't need treatment. And I know some beekeepers. There's a beekeeper in Vermont, Kirk Webster, who hasn't treated, he, he, he produces nucleus colonies. I think he produces about 300 a year. I've, I've had his bees. His bees don't need treatment for Varroa either. Um, so it's possible. We can get there. We can get there. But but I'm afraid the stuff, the, I, I did a test of the, the queen bees that are sold with VSH, Varroa sensitive hygienic. They had, at least under my test conditions, they had no detectable resistance to the Varroa. So I don't think the big queen producers are, are giving us queens that will give us bees that are resistant to varroa. But if you capture wild swarms out in remote places, like it sounds like you can in southern Iowa, maybe, um, you, might get some, you might get some colonies that know how to take care of themselves with respect to varroa. That's been my experience here in southern New York. It's not every colony that I capture in the bait hives that has that ability, but it's eight out of 10. I wrote an article about that in American Bee Journal a few years back, compared it to yeah. um, What would you say the artifacts are you just tree? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? The artifact. Insulation logs of a tree. What what is a general I'm gonna say number of what an artifact would be in a tree? Oh, oh a tree, um yeah, let me just go through the mental math. It would be about an R uh, 
wood is typically about six inches thick. I think that the R factor of, of the pine, for example, is about 0.75 per inch. So it would be on the order of an R4, but um, some of the trees are thicker. They'd be up like an R8. So something in that range, yeah, R4 to R8. I would say, I have to, in my experience so far, I would say the more the better. And as I say, I'm, I'm doing my tests using two inches of extruded polystyrene boards as the, as the outside layer of insulation. Okay, I think that is just about time. Thank you so much for presenting for us. You're welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I guess um, we'll be we'll be getting together again soon, I think, I believe. Yeah. Very good. Okay, great. See you then.